Thank you. So let me begin with a problem we had. I come from Thorgate, and uh, we do lots of product development, uh, various projects for different clients. And we often also host those projects on our servers, because uh, our clients uh, often don't have the necessary know-how themselves. It gives us, as developers, a common and known platform to target. And it also makes it faster to deploy bug fixes and security updates, for example. Uh, we often also put multiple projects into a single server because uh, the projects themselves are not big enough to require a full server. And then at some point, we started having problems with dependency isolation because different projects would require different uh, Python versions or different Postgres versions or some services which might interfere with each other. So we started thinking about Docker and looking if that could help us deal with those issues. Uh, the reason for choosing Docker uh, where that it provides pretty good isolation out of the box, uh, not as strong as virtual machines, but uh, good enough for most use cases. Uh, also, that makes it uh, less error prone to add new services uh, to applications. You don't have to worry as much about uh, breaking something else. And uh, Docker also bundles all the dependencies into a single image, which uh, does not have any external uh, dependencies. So you don't need to worry about uh, package repositories, uh, different versions of uh, Python on different machines, etc. It's all just one fixed bundle. And then the qu question became, how do we get there? Because uh, you can find lots of tutorials online that basically uh, get to the point of running Django's run server in a Docker container. But if you start thinking about how to run more complicated applications and how to architecture the Docker-related parts, then finding good know-how becomes quite difficult. And that's what I'm hoping to fix here today by sharing the experience and lessons that we've had at Thorgate and offering some practical examples. And all the code and examples will also be on GitHub. Now, let me do a very quick refresher on what uh, Docker is and how it works for those less familiar with it. I would say that Docker is a continuation of the virtualization trend. So one way of isolating uh, different applications from each other is just to use different virtual machines for each one of them. But then you have the considerable overhead of uh, having to run a separate operating system for each application. And Docker basically replaces the operating system with, its, uh, with operating system level virtualization that is now built into Linux uh, for a few years. And that means that we can get rid of all the guest uh, operating systems uh, and replace it with uh, Docker, which is a lot leaner. And let's take a bit closer look at what's going on inside Docker. So on the right-hand side uh, of the diagram, you can see more generic uh, operating system level or Docker level objects. And most, Im most important of those are images. Docker images are basically like uh, static executables, which contain everything that your application needs to run. And using those images, you can start containers uh, which are like processes. And uh, the containers are completely isolated from each other, even if they are based on a single image. And finally, we have the volumes, which are used for sharing data. And those are basically directories, which are bind-mounted into the Docker containers. And then you can share data between two different Docker containers or a Docker container and the host itself. And, wow. A bit of music again. I'll just take a chance for having a drink. Mm -hmm. 
where were we? Uh, the volumes. The volumes are also uh, necessary for uh, persisting data because uh, as soon as you stop a Docker container or it just quits, uh, all the data that it has changed is lost. So volumes are basically the only way to persist any data. And uh, let's continue by taking a look at how uh, we decided to run our applications on Docker. And let's begin by taking a look at the application layout and making a few assumptions about uh, what our applications look like. So we'll be talking about applications that have the Django part. Also, we'll be using Node.js for some uh, front-end bundling. Uh, there will be database, obviously. And then, depending on the application, uh, there might be other services as well. We'll also only be looking at uh, applications running within a single uh, server, so no horizontal scaling. And we'll begin by looking at production and then later compare uh, what the differences are in development. And here is a diagram of the approach that we have chosen. Each white shape on this diagram represents a service that is running in a Docker container. And on the left-hand side, you can see a dashed region which contains everything that is uh, specific to our application. Most important of those is the Django itself, but uh, we also have a Node.js part uh, for building the front-end assets, as well as Redis for caching. And as mentioned, there might be other application-specific services there as well. In the middle, uh, we can see a few volumes. Uh, we use those for static assets, uh, uploaded media, as well as log files. And finally, there are Nginx and Postgres, which are uh, global services shared between all applications. Uh, we have uh, chosen to run those in Docker applications, sorry, Docker containers as well, uh, but they're not application specific. And so when an HTTP request comes in, from the right side, it uh, first gets to Nginx, which then uh, forwards it to the correct application's Django container, which then does the usual processing. And now that we have the overall architecture set, let's look at each service in turn, starting with the Django. We built uh, Django images on top of the official Python uh, Docker image, which is the base image, giving us uh, already installed uh, Python as well as pip. Then we add our own project's requirements. We uh, copy the source code of our application into the image and uh, use Kunicorn as uh, the HTTP uh, server. And as mentioned, we also use volumes for data directories such as static media, uh, sorry, static assets and media and log files. And next up, we've got the Node.js service. Uh, Node is a bit special because the only purpose of it is uh, using Webpack for bundling front-end assets, JavaScript and CSS. And that way we can use goodies such as the latest versions of JavaScript as well as SAS for styling and then Webpack uh, basically takes that and bundles it into something that browsers can understand. Uh, and this image or container isn't run continuously in the background. Instead, uh, we use it only to execute a single command uh, during the deploy time. And again, we uh, begin with the node uh, official image, add our JavaScript requirements. And uh, this time we use volumes for uh, the source directories because you don't really need the sources uh, at runtime. And it al also helps us uh, use a single uh, image for both production and development. We'll get to that in a bit. Next, we might have some other services such as Redis, already mentioned, or Celery or something else. And uh, for those, we can quite often use official images uh, without uh, much configuration. Uh, the only thing uh, that we should probably do is using volumes again if we need to persist any data. And as shown, our application consists of uh, multiple services which all run at once 
and then communicate with each other over the network. And we could use some way of uh, controlling all of those services as a single entity. And this is where to Docker Compose comes in. As they say themselves, uh, Docker Compose is a tool for defining and running multi-container Docker applications, which is exactly what we need. Basically, it lets us uh, define a list of services that our application has, and then start and stop and uh, control in other ways all of those uh, services at once. And it also makes uh, networking easier among uh, those services of a single application because uh, it puts them basically into their own private network so that they can all talk to each other without uh, requiring any explicit uh, port forwardings to be defined. And going back to our previous diagram for a moment, uh, you can see that, that the dashed portion, portion on the left is uh, exactly the one that Docker Compose is controlling. Let me also give you a few examples of uh, how Docker Compose, uh, the command line in interface, uh, can be used. Uh, you can build images for all the services you use. You can uh, bring all the services up, meaning starting the containers. You can look at uh, the log files. And you can also run specific commands. In this case, we run uh, migrations using the Django uh, services image. And if all of that was a bit complicated, then uh, the good news is that the servers get uh, quite a bit simpler because uh, you basically only need Docker Engine and Docker Compose available. And in our case, we also have Postgres and Nginx there uh, running as global services, as mentioned, although uh, we run those in Docker containers as well. Let's also talk about the application deploy process. Uh, that one also became a bit uh, simpler because lots of work gets done by the Docker image building process. So what we do um, when deploying is letting uh, Docker Compose build all the updated images for any services that changed. Then we compile the front-end assets using our node uh, service or image. After that, we can uh, run Django's collect static uh, command and uh, apply any migrations to the database. And finally, we tell Docker Compose to restart any services that have changed. Now, let's move on to the development environment. Uh, development and production should ideally be quite uh, similar to each other. But I guess we can all agree that some uh, changes can be uh, useful there. Quick overview of the changes. Uh, we will use slightly different commands. We won't uh, be copying the source files into images. Uh, we do want to use Postgres uh, as local service in this case because we don't want to require developers uh, to download and install the Postgres uh, server uh, themselves and a specific version of it. And to do all that, we'll be using a separate configuration file for Docker Compose. And again, going through the services one by one, uh, Django has uh, the application source files now mounted into the container as volume, because we don't want to rebuild the image whenever we make a small change in the editor. Uh, we, we still keep Python dependencies as part of the image because those uh, does not change as often. And we uh, use a different command, Django's run server, instead of Kunicorn. And uh, again, we use a separate Docker file, which is basically a recipe for the resulting image uh, to be able to easily uh, make those differences. Then uh, the node uh, image is pretty much the same as production. Again, it contains the JavaScript libraries, but not the source code itself. And we run uh, Webpack in watch mode, uh, which is quite similar to Django's run server. It basically runs in the background monitoring for any changes and then rebundling things when needed. 
And all the other services are quite similar to production as well. Uh, as mentioned, Postgres is running locally uh, in this, this time. And we also use uh, volumes for any data, and those volumes uh, for development are put into the project directory to keep everything related to the project in a single place. So now that you've seen our setup for both production as well as development, uh, let's talk about some of the issues that we discovered along the way. And there were quite a few. The first thing you might notice is that whenever we want to run a command, such as uh, do migrations, we need, to apply, we need to prefix the command with something like docker compose or docker. And that got annoying quite quickly. So we made a make file uh, with some shortcuts to help us with that. And then we also created make setup command, uh, which now is the only thing that developer needs to run after a git cloning the repository to get the project up and running on his or her machine. Uh, it basically pulls all the needed uh, Docker images, uh, builds our own uh, service images, uh, applies any database migrations, and uh, does everything else to bring the project up and running. And as a result, the developers don't need to uh, think about installing anything in their machine when they begin uh, working on a new project, which uh, helped with the pro productivity quite a bit. Uh, next, let's, let's talk about service discovery. So on this peak diagram I showed, uh, I, I said that when an HTTP request comes in, then Nginx needs to forward it to the correct application and its Docker container. And because we uh, run Nginx in a container, then it can use Docker's built-in DNS uh, to figure out uh, Django container's IP using its internal uh, host name. Sounds good. But in reality, when you stop and start containers, then their IPs can change. And it turns out that Nginx only does the DNS resolution once when it reads the configuration file. So after some uh, service restarts, you might have HTTP requests uh, sent to a wrong application. So in the end, we created a separate small uh, script or service that uh, monitors Docker for events, uh, such as containers started, and then sends a reload signal uh, to Nginx when that happens. It's not the prettiest solution, but uh, it gets the job done. Uh, we also need to wait for related services when we run uh, for example, uh, a migration command, because we want to ensure that Postgres is available when we do anything with Django. And Docker does not provide any built-in way of doing that, because uh, basically Docker is too low level for that. And so the solution was to use one of the multiple wait for it scripts that are available online. Uh, what they do is basically polling the Postgres uh, socket and waiting until it starts accepting connections and uh, once it does start accepting connections, it just continues with the usual Django startup process. You're also a bit out of luck if you're using uh, something else, uh, something other than Linux, because uh, on any other operating systems, your Docker containers will basically run in a virtual machine. And uh, this has some performance uh, disadvantages, especially regarding file system. Uh, we had some pretty major uh, problems with uh, Webpack because it's monitoring probably tens of thousands of files. And uh, at some point, uh, there were serious issues. Uh, I think they got fixed, but you will uh, not get native performance. Also, uh, on other operating systems, because of the virtual machine being used, you might uh, find out that localhost isn't really localhost anymore because your machine uh, seems to be, looks like an external uh, machine to the Django process that is running inside the container, which might cause some issues with uh, things like Django debug toolbar, and then you need uh, to add a bit of extra configuration to uh, work around that. PyCharm basically supports uh, 
Docker and Docker container quite well uh, with uh, remote interpreters. But uh, there are some bugs uh, that you uh, need to be aware of. For example, if you add a new requirement to your project and then uh, rebuild the Django image, installing it into the image, then uh, PyCharm does not pick up those changes and it keeps uh, annoying you with this package not installed notification. Uh, the workaround I use is just restarting PyCharm. I also had some issues with uh, running the application inside PyCharm uh, until uh, this morning when I got some help with uh, PyCharm guys here. And uh, because uh, the JavaScript dependencies are inside the node image, then uh, PyCharm effectively doesn't see them. And so if you want to browse the sources of some JavaScript dependency, then uh, you also uh, basically need to go to GitHub. Uh, also, uh, most commands now need to be run in Docker containers and uh, prefixed with Docker or Docker Compose or something like that. So many of your scripts and other tools might also need changes. And uh, there were a variety of other small issues uh, that they don't have time to mention here. So getting to the big question, should you use Docker or not? Uh, let's look at the summary of some problems as well as advantages that we've talked about. First, uh, there definitely will be a learning curve. You basically uh, will need to know everything that uh, I have talked about and uh, possibly more. You will also find, uh, you will also spend some time on uh, issues uh, coming from your own project and then fixing those. And uh, in addition to those, there are some ongoing problems, uh, mostly related to tooling because Docker is still somewhat a uh, young project and uh, not supported by all the tools. And uh, as mentioned, if you're not using Linux, then uh, you might have performance issues. Whether or not uh, they are uh, substantial, uh, I guess it depends on the project. But there are also undeniable advantages. We started with the dependency isolation problem and uh, that pretty much got fixed for us. Uh, we can now have multiple projects running side by side using different versions of uh, Python. We also have uh, all the package op uh, Python packages, operating system packages, and everything else uh, bundled into the image, and uh, the versions are fixed. It has also become easier to add new services uh, because we don't have to worry about uh, conflicts with other applications as much. And uh, because Docker bundles everything into a single entity, as mentioned, it's uh, easier to do rollbacks uh, and uh, not worry about uh, remote services going down. Docker also makes it quite easy to limit resource use uh, per service, uh, meaning memory and CPU time allowed. And it also makes it rather easy to monitor the same resources, uh, which uh, I have found more useful than uh, process level monitoring. And we also found some uh, unexpected advantages, such as the uh, single command project setup that's uh, quite useful for developer efficiency. So in the end, it depends. If you're working on a big monolithic application, then moving everything onto Docker might uh, prove to be too much of an effort. But uh, if you're starting with a clean slate, then Docker can, can give you undeniable advantages and uh, it might make perfect sense, but you need to be aware of the potential uh, problems that I've mentioned. And uh, to help you get up and running faster, uh, we're also open sourcing the Docker-based uh, variant of the project template we use at uh, Thorgate. It uh, contains everything that I've shown here, and uh, you can find the GitHub link on my last slide. And uh, <coughs> Let me finish with an analo analogy that really resonates me. Uh, when you start a new project, you get something like uh, two uh, technology points that you can spend on new and experimental technology. So you might choose to spend one of them on Docker 
and perhaps you also decide to use Hazen Kaio, which you are not too familiar with, and now you have spent the two uh, points. And if you then throw something else uh, experimentally into the mix, then you run a serious risk of failing that project. So if you're starting with a project that already has many different experimental parts, then maybe adding Docker to the mix is not such a great idea. But if you're mostly sticking to the familiar territory, then why not give Docker a try? Thank you. Thank you, Rivo. We have some minutes for questions. So if you have some, please line up at the microphone. Otherwise, I think Rivo is more than happy. OK, yes, come, Marcus. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, how do you deal with database rollbacks using Docker? Uh, sorry, database what? Rollbacks. So you deploy something works, doesn't work as you expect. You need to roll back your change. Uh, basically, you need to make your migrations in, in the way that makes it possible. So you can make a migration that uh, starts using the new format, uh, then deploy that, then uh, ensure that everything works, and then later deploy another migration that uh, basically removes the old data. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a, it's like a bunch of questions around the central topic. So uh, around testing, uh, how do you test that everything works together? How this interacts with your continuous integration system? How does it affect testing and development? That in general, anything that you want to add with it? Uh, we use Drone for continuous integration, which uh, internally also uses Docker. Unfortunately, they do it in a slightly different way, so we ended up using a different configuration for uh, the CI as well. But in general, I think uh, that uh, because uh, you run your tests on Docker, and Docker makes it really easy to test uh, the entire uh, scope of your project, including all the services, uh, database, Redis, and so on, then it makes it uh, more reliable uh, that the same combination will work in the production environment as well. Thanks for your talk. I remember you mentioned uh, making a custom script for tracking, monitoring if Nginx is down. Uh, can you tell me more about that particular script? Uh, it's about reloading Nginx when uh, the containers are restarted. So basically, when we have a running container and uh, we then uh, restart it, then it might get a different IP. And uh, Nginx will still remember the old IP and will continue routing all the requests to the old IP. IP. So we need to somehow tell uh, Nginx that uh, this container now has a different IP. And we just decided to do that by uh, sending the reload signal. I think that if you use the uh, commercial version of Nginx, uh, then they have something built in to deal with these issues. Hey, so what's the deal with the horizontal scaling? How is the status on that? Horizontal scaling is a pretty big topic on its own. Uh, we have looked slightly into Docker Swarm, which lets you uh, say that I want uh, 10 instances of this uh, one service running. And uh, it can also automatically uh, route uh, the requests uh, between the nodes of the cluster so that uh, it will end up with uh, at one of those instances. Uh, that's one option. Uh, Kubernetes is another option. And then uh, Docker Compose also has some rudimentary support for horizontal scaling, but uh, uh, I wouldn't say you want to use it in production. Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, how do you monitor your Docker containers, uh, for example, in cases when they consume too many CPU or memory, when, how do you manage this? Uh, we use something called Telegraph from the Influx stack to monitor our systems, and uh, they have Docker plugin as well. So basically, all of the Docker container uh, resource use gets pulled into the central system. And uh, then we can take a look at that and define alerts. Mm, thanks. Thank you for your question, and thank you, Rivo, for your talk. Thank you.